Are you ready for your first month as a beekeeper? Personally, my first month, I, I was worried before I got my bees for the first time. Were they gonna fly away? Were they gonna die? They weren't all rational fears, just scared about doing something new that I'd never done before. So this video is about your first month as a beekeeper so you are prepared, so you know what you need to have ready and not feel so overwhelmed by all the things you don't even need to know just yet. This video is broken up into four parts. The first part is the week before your bees, what you need to do, have ready, have made. Second part is picking up, transporting and installing your bees. The third part is what you do to care for your bees as a beekeeper that first month. And the fourth part is what you should be learning so that you know what to do when your beehive grows in the coming months after your first month getting your bees. So now it's a couple weeks before you're getting your bees or the week before, and we wanna be prepared for when we pick them up. First, you need your beehive ready. You should have painted it a few weeks ago so that it was out in the sun and could air out. If you have a top bar hive, I wanna give you a tip this <laughs> really cost me like $200. Bees are more likely to abscond, which means completely take off when installing them into a very new top bar hive. If you know a beekeeper or can go to your bee club, ask someone if you can just get some used like honeycomb, beeswax, something that was inside a beehive that you can put somewhere inside the bottom so that your bees do not abscond either. The smell of bees will make your bees more likely to stay. With other style hives, I have not found that the bees abscond the way they do so easily in a brand new top bar hive. So you do not want your beekeeping equipment to look like this. We want to take our, if you have a Langstroth style hive, you're going to have your bottom board. You are going to have one deep box and the appropriate amount of frames for that box. Put a lid on top. If you wanna use foundation, pop them in your frames. If you don't wanna use foundation, that is totally fine and acceptable and what I choose to do. And leave your frames totally empty. And then of course you wanna put it down on the ground, at least elevated at eight inches off the ground. You are going to need more equipment as your hive expands, but for now, for the first month, you do not need more than one box plus the amount of frames that go in that box. And of course, if you are getting a nuke, that means that there are gonna be frames in that nuke and you don't even need 10 full frames for your 10 frame box. You probably need more like six. And you're gonna to want to have your protective gear ready and waiting. Wash it because you know what? Bees don't like smells. They are very sensitive to smells. So if your laundry detergent or dryer sheets have a nice strong flowery smell, don't think that the bees are gonna like it. I don't recommend <laughs> the cheapest uh, jacket you can find on Amazon. This one broke very quickly and now has this little pokey thing stabbing me. Have at least one hive tool, but a few hive tools are ideal. You also wanna get your smoker ready. You have your smoker, you're gonna need a lighter, and you're gonna need two kinds of kindling. The first kind of kindling, just like you were starting a campfire, would be something that ignites really quickly, but it'll burn really fast. So a ball of newspaper, um, dried up grass clippings, dryer lint, those are all great for the first. And then once you have that little fire in your smoker, then you're going to want the second kind of kindling that burns a little bit slower. Here I use the bark from the ohia tree, um, pine needles. Some people use burlap. I found that burns a little bit too hot for my taste, but lots of different options. And the final thing you want to do and have ready is feed for your bees. If you purchased a package of bees, that means your bees are coming in this screened off cage and you are going to need feed for them immediately. If you bought a nuke that looks like this and it's like half the size of a full box, Langstroth box of bees, and there will be one or two frames of honey and you will not need feed immediately. To make feed, what you do is you take water. So for instance, starting out, say you have two beehives, what I recommend doing is taking four quarts of water, putting it in a pot and bringing it to a boil. Once the water is boiling, take it off the heat and then you are going to add the same amount that you did of water and dry white sugar to and add it slowly to the water and stir it up until the sugar is fully dissolved in the water. If you're having difficulty getting it to dissolve, put it back on the heat, just not so hot, and continue to stir it until it is fully dissolved. Then take it off the heat and let it cool. 
You are then, once it is fully cool, you want to add a supplement. This can be Honey Bee Healthy or whatever brand you like. I recommend getting this from a beekeeping supply site over making your own. It's a combination of essential oils that helps the bees digest the sugar syrup so that they do not get nosema, which is spores in their digestive tract. It can lead a colony to collapse. So you might ask, why am I feeding them dry white sugar? It's probably the least healthy kind of sugar we could give them. But trust me on this, do not give them corn syrup, honey, brown sugar, <laughs> cane sugar, powdered sugar, dry white sugar. And I believe the primary reason for this is because there isn't minerals and other things in there that can potentially harm the bees. The dry white sugar has just nothing. Everything in it has been killed and bleached. And so that's why you're adding the supplement so that you're adding things to help the bees and you know there is nothing in there that can harm the bees. Powdered sugar, for instance, has cornstarch added to it and that can really harm the bees. To feed your bees, what you wanna do is put them in a feeder and put it inside your hive. You wanna make sure you do not feed the bees outside the hive because then uh, it's important to know that bees want the location of their hive secret. This is supposed to be a secret. It's why, one reason why when inspecting your hive, you don't wanna leave a bunch of frames out, you don't wanna leave comb on the ground, and you don't want the hive open for long. You don't want wasps and bees from other hives flying by and smelling the comb and honey and knowing where they are located because bees and other pollinators will rob each other to the point that the colony collapses. So you want your beehives to be a secret and having a whole bunch of food for any neighborhood pollinator to grab is a big, big beekeeping no-no. And be the pollinators will remember this. If they grabbed honey or free food from a location in the springtime, they will come back in the fall when there is a shortage of food again. You can make a feeder. This is one I made a long time ago. It is just a jar with a lid and I drilled holes in the lid. It hangs upside down. I really don't recommend this. <laughs> or the feeder where you just fill up a Ziploc bag. I have read so many different things. I have tried them all in the 13 plus years I've been keeping bees. And what can happen is that it drips too much onto your cluster and if it gets cold out or just never stops dripping, what's gonna happen is that you're gonna have this pool on the bottom board inside your hive that bees can drown in or it's gonna drip on your bees. And when temperatures get cold out at nighttime, it can potentially cause your hive to collapse. So I recommend getting a feeder that is inside, not right at the entrance, but where bees in, only the bees inside your hive can find it and access it. You should also buy some pollen patties. The smallest quantity that beekeeping supply sites sell is ideal and uh, you might not need it, but it's always good to just put a little bit in the hive and see if the bees take to it or not. Okay, it is part two, the day that you are picking up your bees. So first, when going to pick up your bees, you might wanna bring your veil with you. This is not necessary, but if you think you might be uncomfortable being at the farm and having bees flying around, it's a good idea to bring the veil in case you need it. Also, if you are putting your bees in a car, that's totally fine. What I recommend bringing is a mosquito net. If you have a package of bees, this is not necessary. You're just going to inspect the package before you put it in your vehicle and make sure there are no gaps that bees can get out and just brush off any bees that are on your package. You can put it in your trunk or you can put it in the back seat of your car. If um, there should be a can with syrup inside. So I recommend putting something down if you don't have rubber mats in your car, putting something down under the package so that uh, sugar syrup isn't dripping out onto the floor in your vehicle. If it's in the bed of a truck, then you want to make sure it's strapped down so that it can fly all over the place when you're driving. If you have a nucleus hive, then that means you're having it in this box. It might be cardboard or it might be made of wood. And in that case, what I recommend to people is to bring either duct tape or a ratchet strap so that you make sure that the lid is firmly attached to the bottom. When transporting your bees, you wanna make sure that they have ventilation, but that they also can't just like 
fly out of the hive and go wherever they want to. So for instance, this cardboard nuke box has holes poked into it for ventilation. And then it comes with this yellow cork that you can plug up the entrance so bees can't get out when they're in uh, being transported. The second thing that you would want to do is bring a mosquito net. Whether it comes in a box like this or a wooden box, an easy way to make sure that bees have adequate ventilation but aren't getting into your car or flying around all over the place when in the back of your truck is to wrap it in a mosquito net. I actually used to keep a mosquito net in my beekeeping supply kit in my, the trunk of my car all the time because I had to move bees fairly frequently without notice. And so you just take a mosquito net and wrap it around the box and make sure that there's no way, no holes, you know, you don't have to like tie it or anything, but just make sure that it's the openings are all gathered. So that now this way, even if you don't have a cork for this, it's giving the bees adequate ventilation, but any bees that get out will still be stuck with the hive until you put them down in their location. And if you're concerned that bees are gonna get out of a package and be inside your car, then get a mosquito net for your package of bees as well. If you're concerned that this isn't adequate ventilation for the bees, then leave the entrance open and just put a very big mosquito net that you make sure bees can't get out of inside uh, around the box. When you bring your bees back to your home, what you want is to have your feeder with the feed in it inside the beehive. You are going to, if you have a package of bees, you're going to want a spray bottle full of sugar feed inside here, inside your spray bottle. You are going to want also a thumbtack or a stapler. And so the order of events is that you take the can with the feed out, you take the queen out, you put the queen in the hive, and then you put the bees in the hive along with the can of feed and a little bit of pollen and you close it up. If you have a nuke, then you're gonna put the feeder in, then you're gonna put your frames in, then you are going to shake any straggler bees from the box inside or just leave the box on the side next to the beehive and close it up. There are lots of videos where you can on YouTube where you can watch people doing this. I show people how to do it on my online beekeeping supply site. And usually when you pick up your bees, they do a little bit of a demonstration. I recommend watching one of these videos before you pick up your bees the day of or the day before as a refresher. But more importantly, what happens if the weather is bad and you can't do it the day you get your bees, which happened to me my second year as a beekeeper. Actually, my first year, the bees were delayed a couple of weeks because of a bad storm. And then my second year, the it was snowing out when we picked up our bees uh and i had to drive all the way from philadelphia almost completely to harrisburg to get the bees which was uh, over an hour away uh, each way uh, to pick them up and and so if the weather is bad and you can't install your bees that day if you have a package what you want to do is put them somewhere that is cool not, not freezing cold, but also not warm. You don't want it in your house. You don't want it where there's bright lights. Ideally, you would have a basement or a garage that you can put them in so that they're not freezing, but they're also not getting too warm. And you also wanna make sure they have food. So there should be a can inside your package and you can just give the package a little bit of a shake to ensure that you can tell that there's liquid or look to make sure you see bees gathering liquid from the bottom of the can. You can also though, as a precaution, put some sugar feed into a spray bottle and spray the package down and do that a few times a day so that you're giving them some, uh, something to eat. And as soon as the weather clears up and you are able to, then put the bees into the beehive. If you have a nuke, then what you wanna do is just set the nuke box next to the actual beehive. If it is a cardboard nuke box, then what I like to do is just take a board or something and have it on top of the cardboard, just so that it, if it rains or something, rain isn't getting into the cardboard box and the box isn't turning to mush. Uh, bees are fine in a nuke box for a while. It's just they will swarm pretty quickly as soon as they have a chance to grow and uh, they run out of space. Uh, 
Step three is the most important step, that is caring for your bees that first month that you get them. Now, what you do is gonna vary depending on where you live and the climate and how many flowers are blooming. But for most people, when you're receiving your bees, there could be not much food for the bees to gather. So it is important to provide feed for them. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, you made that sugar syrup, you added honey bee healthy or some kind of supplement to it to help them digest it better and you want the feed inside the hive. You're gonna check on the feed. You know, if your feet are small, you're gonna have to check on it more often and replace it more often. You wanna just keep replacing it as the bees use it. If it's still full or halfway full, then don't fill it up again until they need more. If it's empty, put more in. And for that first month, give them as much food as they want. They're kind of like having a newborn baby. You can't baby them too much in that those first few weeks. Give them what they need. And then it's once you know that there is lots of flowers blooming and food for them to gather that you can start to cut them off and tell them they need to start finding their own food. The second feed you would be giving your bees is pollen. However, this is gonna be in a very small amount. And if the bees take to it, then you can give them a little bit more and a little bit bigger piece if you think that they are going to use it. If you live in a warm climate, I do not recommend using pollen patties. Small hive beetle worms love this stuff and I find that it gets slimed out very quickly because the bees don't guard it. It's not really something that they think they need to protect and it can lead a colony to collapse. If you really find it necessary, you can put a tiny little bit in, but keep an eye on it and check on it and literally just like three days later. It's gonna be under the lid and so, uh, right on the top bars. And so it's really easy to just peek in and make sure it's not looking slimy or you don't see any white worms or black beetles crawling on it. If you do, take it out immediately and wipe off any areas that look slimy or that you see larva walking on it. The second thing you're going to do is inspect your hives. And this is what you're going to be doing as a beekeeper throughout the entire season. Every week or every other week, you want to open the hive and make sure that everything that should be there is there and things that should not be there are not there. This is the start to how to care for bees. I have a link in the video description below for my inspection sheet and it's a great way to just guide you through an inspection so you know what you're looking for and keep record of what you have. You don't want to open up the hive more often than every two weeks or every week uh, should be the most often that you open your hive because you want, don't want to bother them while they're first getting started because it is very disruptive to have a hive open, especially to have that brood section disturbed. You wanna keep your inspections down to a minimum. So for a small hive that's just, you know, four to six frames of bees, you shouldn't have the hive open for more than 30 minutes, but you should really try to aim for a 20 minute inspection. When I was trying to keep my inspections a little bit shorter, what I did was said, I don't wanna spend more than 30 minutes opening a hive. So I set my timer for 20 minutes cause I knew it took a while for me to put everything back and close up the lid and that was my warning that it was time to wrap things up. Now, since you are a beginner beekeeper, the, this third step is incredibly important your first month, and that is to work on your identification skills. I have two videos out about how to read a frame and identify what's inside the beehive, and you should check them out, watch them numerous times, as well as a free download that you can print out and bring with you to the hives to help you identify the queen, worker, drone, eggs, larva, pupa, capped brood versus capped honey, bee bread, and nectar. Work on these spotting skills, especially your queen spotting and egg spotting skills. It's going to be a lot harder to find a queen when you have 60,000 bees in a hive than right now when you have 5,000 bees in a hive or probably even less. Uh, as the days and weeks go by that you are getting your bees, the hive is going to get smaller and smaller, especially if you have a, if you have a package. And that is because you have no baby bees hatching yet because it takes 28 days for that queen for an egg from the queen laying it to hatching, but you're having bees dying every single day. And so the population is going to go down before it starts to go up with those first few baby bees hatching. If you bought a nuke, then your high population should just start to climb uh, as the weeks go by. 
The next thing you should do is spend time with your bees where you're not bothering them. You want to get a feel for their activity, a feel for their temper, a feel for the sounds they make, how the buzzing sounds change, and just their presence. So what you want to do is get a chair and sit next to your beehive. Sit next to them in the morning when you have your coffee, sit next to them in the evening before you go to bed, sunrise, sunset, in the middle of the day, it doesn't matter. You'll be surprised at how early bees are leaving the hive. I ha had a beehive outside my bedroom window once. <laughs> Don't ask us silly reason uh, and I was surprised sun wasn't even up still dark out and I heard a buzzing sound of bees like flying and coming and going from the hive before it was even six o'clock in the morning a lot of beekeeping is developing an intuition and just having a feel for when something is wrong something is just not the way it usually is. The sound is a little bit different. Uh, the buzzing sound changes. It lets you know it's time to close up the hive or that maybe there's no queen. And those are things that we cannot teach you, any of these YouTubers, uh, any of your mentors or teachers or anybody, any other beekeeper. It's just a matter of getting used to it and seeing what the norm is and what it usually is and then knowing when it's a little bit different. And the best way to do that is not by uh, opening the hive and interfering in their day-to-day -day activities and really causing a disruption to their life but by just sitting next to the hive and getting a feel for what they are like when they are calm and active. Oh, don't forget to watch their activity. So when you are sitting there next to the hive, look at the landing board. Uh, if your bottom board doesn't have one, it's fun to make a little bit of a landing board so that the bees have somewhere to land before they walk into the entrance. And if you look at the landing board, you'll see our bees landing and they have these little yellowy orange balls on the sides of their legs, which means they're bringing in pollen and there's lots of uh, baby bees that they're looking to feed. Our bees landing and then sticking out their proboscis and passing off nectar to another bee, which means they brought back honey. Um, our bees landing and having another bee jump on them, which means that they might be a robber bee. Uh, are you seeing drones landing on the bottom, bottom board? Uh, are you seeing bees flying in little circles up above the hive, which means that bees are going on orientation flights and getting used to the neighborhood before they go and leave the hive for the first time and search for food? So many fun things that you'll be able to see just by sitting outside the hive. And there are two other things that you're going to be doing to care for your bees in this first month. The next one is managing space, because after all, that is one of the big roles of the beekeeper is you are space manager. <laughs> you, what you're essentially doing is when they don't have enough room, you give them more room. And when they don't need that much room anymore, you take it away. So in the springtime is usually when people are getting their bees. But if you've got a new beehive, then this is what's going to happen. No matter the time of year, they are going to be growing. So when there is two empty frames inside your beehive or less, that's when you're going to add another box. There's two empty bars or frames in your top bar hive or whatever style hive it is, or less, that's when you are going to give them more space. For a top bar hive or a long Langstroth hive, that would be moving the follower board out so that you can fit more frames in and just giving the bees more room to grow and places for the queen to lay. When it comes to managing space, I'm going to let you in on a little tip on how to encourage your bees to build comb and for the queen to lay a little bit more, a little bit faster. And that is to checkerboard your frames. So when you have a box and you have, you install your frames, you're gonna put all your bird frames and honey in the middle and the empty frames on the side. But when you open your hive up two weeks later or four weeks later, what you wanna do is start to take those empty frames and put them in between your frames of brood. You never want more than one empty frame uh, together but you want it to be every other frame like a checkerboard. So what you're gonna have is the wall of your beehive, follower board, side of the box, whatever it is, then you're going to have an empty frame. Then you're going to have your frame of food, honey, pollen, 
that's what's always first and then you would put an empty frame and then you would put a frame of brood those baby bees eggs larva pupa whatever it might be and then you might put another empty frame and then another frame or two of brood and then another empty frame and then some more brood another empty frame some honey and then the rest of your empty frames. And when you do that and you have an empty frame in between frames of brood, you're encouraging bees to close up that gap in the brood nest uh, as opposed to having that hole. And you're making the queen more aware of the fact that there is this space for her to lay. So she's not roaming around trying to find somewhere to lay next. After all, in the very beginning stages, the queen has to wait for the bees to build honeycomb before she can start doing her job. And then once she starts doing her job, she's going to be a little bit slow to start until she really gets into the swing of things. So be patient with your bees and your queen as they get up and running. And the final thing that the beekeeper is going to be doing to care for their bees in this first month is being that extra guard against pests. That main pest that you're going to be seeing is the varroa mite, but there is also a small hive beetle and wax moth. So let's start with the easiest of them all, which is wax moth. Wax moth is just this pest that likes to lay their eggs in um, unguarded beeswax, and then that larva squirms around and makes this webbing, and it can cause a weak or very small hive to collapse. So the only thing you need to do is make sure that if something has beeswax on it and was outside the hive for, you know, more than a few hours, you freeze it before you put it back in the hive. Or you scrape all the beeswax off before you put that equipment inside your hive. Pretty easy to do. Next is small hive beetle. A little bit more difficult to deal with if you live in an area that is warm and does not have a frost. A beehive is small and there is food, uh, nectar, pollen, honey, or a honeycomb for the small hive beetle to run around on, lay their eggs for the larva to squirm around on. And there's not enough bees in the hive to guard this and to keep those hive beetles away. That's when a problem can occur. So you don't want to put a ton of frames of honey into your beehive uh, when the population is low. You don't want to put a lot of frames of drawn out honeycomb in the hive when the population is low. You want to add these things in if you have them um, slowly as your hive starts to expand. So for someone who is in their first month and doesn't have any of this honey or honeycomb, it's fairly easy to make sure you don't have a hive beetle infestation the primary thing you're doing is just making sure that um, you are not giving them too much space before they need it. Once your hive gets smaller later on in the year, you want to take those excess frames of honeycomb and pollen and honey off of the hive so that hive beetles don't start to uh, take advantage of that unguarded comb. Uh, but the big pest we all are talking about is the varroa mite, and that is the one that you are really going to be concerned about as your first month as a beekeeper. So there's nothing that you need to do for the varroa mite your first month. Um, what I recommend for all beekeepers, whether you choose to treat or intervene in any way, uh, it doesn't matter. It's good to know what your varroa mite levels are so you know what you're working with. You know where your mistakes were. You know what happened so that you can do something different next year. And the only way to know what's going on in your hive is to do a varroa mite test. That being said, that is not something you need to do your first month. The only thing I recommend doing is before you get your bees or when you're there to pick up your bees, ask the people you are buying your bees from if the bees were treated for varroa mites that spring and how long ago that was. Most people that you buy bees from, that's not their bees. They just drove down to a warmer climate, picked up bees and brought them back. When I bought bees in Philly, they went down to Tennessee and Georgia, brought them up. It's very common because in those climates, the bees are already up and running and they can split hives and they're breeding queens and it's too cold to do those things um, in the northern states. And that is totally acceptable and there's nothing wrong with that. 
but it's still good to know. And that's why I recommend doing this before you pick up your bees even, so that they can ask the people and that they have an answer for you. Uh, some places do treat their bees before they sell them and some places don't. And it's good to know what was done for your bees. But your first month as a beekeeper, you don't need to put any kind of treatment in, nor do you need to do a mite test. The reason why is that my tests require taking a sampling of bees and putting them in a jar and um, seeing how many mites are on that sampling of bees. Now, a very effective way to do it requires killing all of the bees in that sampling, and that's not something that you want to do when your hive population is low. It also requires taking a sampling of bees, and you are new to spotting a queen, so I do not recommend pulling bees and possibly taking the queen with them and killing her in, in this process. Even if you do a route that doesn't involve killing your bees, there's a good chance that you could be grabbing the queen and harming her. So do not do any kind of mite tests or treatments your first month. If you bought a package of bees, there is absolutely no reason to even have to treat because your mite levels are going to be insanely low. And that is because over 95% of the rural mites in a beehive are actually feeding off of the baby pupa in those cells that are capped. So without any pupa in your hive, because you just have a package with adult bees and no baby pupating bees, there's hardly going to be any rural mites in your hive. If you bought a nuke, there is a much, there's, there's going to be a much higher uh, level of rural mites in your hive. It's just, the hive is going to be very small and I don't recommend putting in any kind of treatment, whether you want to or not at this stage. But this brings me on to the final step, which is what you should be doing in preparation for the next few months as a beekeeper. There is no need to learn about everything you need to do as a beekeeper before you get your bees. But now that you have bees, this is a great time to start learning about the next steps. And it's going to make a lot more sense to you now that you have bees and are a little bit more familiar with all those things and concepts that you were learning about. So one of the really important things you're going to be learning about now so that you are aware of it in the next couple of months is preventing swarming and splitting, splitting a beehive. Preventing swarming is done because honeybees want to swarm. It's what they do when they are healthy, when they are doing well, when they're bringing in lots of food and the queen is laying and there's not enough room in the hive. So the beekeeper usually wants to prevent swarming so that the swarm doesn't go somewhere unwanted, say under the eaves of their house or into the shed or a neighbor's property. If you live in an area where there is nobody for miles, then you might not want to prevent swarming because swarming is a really one of the number one ways that bees naturally deal with rural mites all on their own. As a beekeeper, usually we prevent swarming by splitting the beehive and manually swarming the bees for them. So instead of that swarm going somewhere where you don't know, somewhere maybe unwanted, you swarm for them and now you have that swarm in your possession. You really want to learn how to prevent swarming. It's a common misconception that people just think they can keep on putting boxes and boxes on top of their beehive and adding space. And that is not true. You want to give space to the brood nest. And I have a very detailed step-by-step -step video on how to split a beehive in order to prevent swarming that you can find in the video description below. You also want to know where you can buy a queen locally if needed. A great way to help the genetics of your hive and to help your bees deal with your local climate is to buy bees locally. But as I said, it's really hard to buy bees locally because usually the local beekeepers are buying them from somewhere down south and just bringing them up for you in the springtime. So what you do is you want to buy some local queens because all the genetics of the beehive comes from the mom, AKA the queen bee. Also, there might be a time when your bees swarm or you just need a queen, something happens, she flies away when you're inspecting them, she accidentally gets pinched, things happen, it's okay, plan for it and have a place to go to if you need to buy a queen bee. Preferably locally, I live in Hawaii, but I don't recommend going to some of these Hawaii queen breeders and having them ship a queen bee 5,000 miles to your house. Go with somewhere nearby. 
if you live in an area where there are small hive beetles, primarily places without a frost, or that have a very short cold winter, you want to know how to deal with small hive beetles. You might want to have a trap on the bottom. Uh, here, since hive beetle population is very high, it's best to have a trap under the beehive and a trap on top. And I have a video all about small hive beetle traps, what works and what doesn't, how to use them, and how to deal with small hive beetles in the video description below if you need it. You also want to know how to deal with robbing because when lots of flowers start blooming, the beehive gets really big and the bees are super happy and everything seems great. But then the flowers die off and the bees aren't happy and they get really mad. The hive population is still really high. There's lots of bees flying around looking for food. And when they can't find food from flowers, what they do is they go looking to steal it. They don't care. They don't have a conscience. They don't care if they're killing a hive, robbing it to death. They will go steal honey. Not only other honeybees, but other kinds of bees and primarily wasps. So what you want to do is know how to prevent your hive from collapsing due to robbing and what to do when robbing season starts. If you live in an area where it gets really hot out, then you're probably going to also want to know what to do in the hot summer heat so that your bees can cool their hive down sufficiently. And the final thing you want to learn about is what to do about varroa mite levels. There are a lot of different ways that you can address this topic. Some people choose to do nothing. Some people choose to only interfere with natural techniques. Some people use treatments, inorganic and organic. What I recommend doing as your first year as a beekeeper is to not have incredibly high standards to do everything perfectly and to never introduce any kind of chemical treatment into your hive and to make it your goal to have at least 70 no, let's say 50% of the bees that you have this spring still alive come next spring. Like make that your goal. Whatever you need to do, just at least half of the bees that you get right now in this first month are still alive 12 months from now. Make that your goal. And then next year, work on a goal to be uh, treatment free, but interfere naturally. And then from there, make it a goal to be totally treatment free and to not have to do anything. But it really depends on your location and the genetics, whether that is something that will be possible for you. And so starting out as your first year as a beekeeper, I recommend just one, doing a mite test every single month, not your first month, of course, maybe not even your second month, but from there on out, when you're comfortable finding your queen and you know you don't have her, then doing a mite test so that you know what your mite levels are. This doesn't make you a treatment free beekeeper or mean that you're treating. It just means that you know what's going on. And then also have a plan for what to do if your mite levels get above three uh, natural techniques to lower your mites. And then if your mite level is above five, with these, mite, with these natural techniques, know what to do so you can bring your mite levels down. And then make a goals for your next few years to become treatment free and to uh, not interfere uh, in lowering your mite levels. But make it your goal to just keep your bees alive your first year and then work your way up to some higher standards. Don't try to make it all perfect. If any of these steps are things that you need to learn more about, check the video description for the links to videos that go a little bit more in depth or sign up for my online class and it's free for the first month and $19 a month after that. And it includes mentorship so you can email me whenever you need to with a question. Your first month as a beekeeper is going to be crazy. I am really excited for you. You're going to make a lot of mistakes and I hope that's one of your goals to make a bunch of stupid mistakes and to laugh at yourself. Take a lot of pictures and videos. If you start to feel yourself getting overwhelmed, make sure you have some fun things that remind you why you wanted to get into beekeeping. It might be Instagram profiles that you, you like to follow, fun books, um, playing in the garden with your kids and looking for beetles and other bugs like I like to do with my kids. Watching more um, inspirational YouTube videos, like I, there was a video by Just Alex that was a lot of fun that showed his first year as a beekeeper. Watching beekeeping documentaries and just fun beekeeping books, not the ones that are really 
and I will see you in the next video, which should be watching my two videos on identifying what is inside the beehive. Because if you can do that, you are 50% of the way there. And by there, I mean, you know, to feeling like you kind of know what you're doing as a beekeeper.